Welcome to your new lecture. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 22 in the textbook, uh, the integumentary system. So before we get into it, let's do a quick little introduction. Uh, when we talk about the integument, we're not just talking about the skin, but we're going to be talking about all the accessory glands that go along with it, including sweat glands and oil glands, as long as the appendages like hair and nails as well. So one of the just the random facts that the emplex likes to ask about is little things like what's the largest organ of the body, and in this case, it's going to be the integument or the skin uh, system. Uh, the largest internal organ, or the largest visceral organ, would be the liver, but the largest organ overall is going to be the skin. And it's going to be mostly connective tissue under a layer of epithelial tissue. If you remember, epithelial tissue is going to be tissue that covers uh, parts of the body. So in this case, we're covering the entire outer aspect of the body with our skin. As far as the physiology, there's going to be a whole host of different things that the integument is responsible for. So we're going to go one by one through each of these and take a closer look. When we look at uh, protection, the skin's going to be your first line of defense against the entire environment around you. So the skin's going to act as a physical, biological, and chemical barrier uh, to the world around us. So that's going to include things like protecting us from uh, ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So there's UV rays that uh, hit us can cause damage to our DNA, as we saw when we looked at radiation in our cellular system. So the skin's going to try to prevent the breakdown of our DNA through the radiation of these UV uh, rays, particularly the UVB rays that the sun emits. Uh, it also prevents us from losing fluids. Our body is going to be around 70% water. So in order to keep that water inside us, we're going to need a protective barrier that prevents water from escaping. So there's going to be fatty, oily substances within our skin that act as that barrier because we know water and oil don't mix. So it's not only going to keep water in, it's also going to keep water from um, coming out as well. So one of the big things with people who suffer large burns over their entire bodies is besides having uh, a lack of barrier against pathogens, that it's very hard for them to maintain uh, a fluid balance because the fluid just leaks out of their open uh, burn wounds. And as I just said, it's also going to protect us from pathogens. So there's bacteria and viruses all over the place. So the skin's going to be our first line of defense in keeping them outside from inside our body. Uh, to do this, we're going to secrete uh, certain substances that inhibit pathogenic growth. Uh, we're going to look at the types of oil that our skin secretes. And together with the sweat, this is going to create what we call an acid mantle. So there's going to be a thin covering of sweat and oil all over our body. And this is going to give our skin a lower pH, so a slightly acidic pH, between about 4.5 to 6.2. So some, most, some bacteria aren't going to grow very well there. But not only that, if a bacteria does uh, acclimate to this low pH on our skin, if it gets into our blood, which is alkaline, so it's going to be above 7 on the pH scale, it's not going to be suited for an alkaline environment. So the bacteria on our skin doesn't live very well uh, if it gets into our blood. And that's uh, very important not to get uh, an infection in the blood. The skin's also good for absorption, so there's many things skin can absorb. If you can see in these group of three here, we have a bunch of fat-soluble molecules and vitamins. And uh, steroids are also going to be uh, created with uh, fatty acids as well. So as we said, uh, the oil in our skin is going to keep water uh, from getting in and out. So because we have this fatty barrier, things made of fat are going to be able to uh, penetrate or absorb much more easily through that layer. Uh, along with that, certain heavy metals can pass through our skin, like lead, mercury, and nickel. So here we have a picture from Alice in Wonderland. And the whole reason that the Mad Hatter was crazy is because back in the day, uh, the way they used to make these hats was with uh, mercury. And uh, these workers working around mercury and wearing the hats for so long, the mercury would seep through the uh, dermis of their skull and eventually penetrate into the bloodstream and cause uh, poisoning of the nervous system. And you see the same thing with Flint, Michigan, with lead in the water, people taking showers and lead uh, not being safe as well. Not only that, they were uh, ingesting it too, which is even worse. There's going to be certain resins from uh, plants like poison ivy. Uh, the typical, the type of, there's a certain type of oil called the uh, urush oil uh, induced contact dermatitis. So when you get poison ivy and you get that classic rash, itchy rash, that's what's going to be caused by this certain type of dermatitis. And if you remember, derma means skin, and itis is going to mean inflammation. 
So lots of rashes are going to cause a dermatitis. And lastly, uh, because the skin can absorb certain uh, molecules or chemicals, uh, we're going to use that as a way of um, taking certain types of drugs. So here we can see a fentanyl patch, so we can take opioids through the skin. Uh, we've heard of nicotine patches or birth control patches. Uh, those are the more classic examples. It's not easy to get a uh, drug to penetrate through the skin, so there aren't a lot of drug patches, but there is a whole host of benefits from being able to get the drug delivered directly to the skin. One, you don't need to do needles. Uh, you don't need to ingest it whenever you take a drug uh, through your digestive system. Not only is the stomach acid going to break it down, but it also is going to pass through the liver before it gets into the bloodstream. So the liver is going to break down a lot of the chemicals as well. So uh, patches or transdermal medications are going to uh, kind of bypass all those drawbacks. Uh, when we talk about massage, um, if you come across a transdermal patch, the general rule is that you want to stay about uh, six inches radius around the patch. Uh, one, because if you were to massage the patch directly, you might speed up the release of that drug, and uh, that's not what you want to do because there's a certain uh, time course that these patches are meant to deliver the drugs in a steady course. Uh, but also the oil or lubricant that we're using is going to uh, possibly mess up the adhesiveness on this patch. And if it were to come uh, off of the skin, uh, you would affect the drug delivery as well. So better safe to be sorry if, say, if it's on the arm, like in this case, this is going to be the anterior part of the biceps, I would just skip the entire uh, upper arm area to avoid any uh, complications. The skin's also going to be used for vitamin D synthesis. As those UV rays hit our skin, there's going to be a chemical pathway that the body's going to uh, perform to turn that into vitamin D. It's more complicated, we know, but the idea is that you do want to expose your uh, bare skin to uh, a certain amount of sunlight per day. I think the latest recommendations are about 10 to 30 minutes uh, a day, at least a couple days a week. Uh, part of the reason why I gave myself a nice little haircut with this quarantine, I'm not really going outside a whole lot, so when I do, I'm getting a little bit extra UV rays on the top of my head. Skin's also gonna be important for temperature regulation. So it's gonna be able to control um, how close our blood uh, gets to the surface of the skin. So the closer the blood gets to that surface, uh, the more heat can radiate out from it. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna either uh, constrict or dilate our blood vessels. So we saw this picture from last chapter. Again, the dark red and green areas signify uh, higher temperatures, whereas the lower uh, green or purple regions are going to be colder temperatures. So I don't remember if I said last time, but this particular person in this picture actually has a, a sympathetic nervous system disorder where their autonomic nervous system doesn't work properly in these bright red limbs. And because their autonomic nervous system doesn't work, it can't tell those blood vessels to uh, dilate or to constrict. So in this case, they can't dissipate that heat in these uh, arm and upper chest region, and that's why it's so hot here. This person physically can't sweat. And the way that this does this, like I said, the uh, capillary blood vessels are going to uh, either constrict or dilate. So when we say dilate, these are going to get... Um, the vessels closer to the surface of the skin here are going to be uh, utilized more. So there's going to be more blood that passes through. And since it's closer to the surface, we're now going to uh, dissipate some of that heat. Whereas when it's cold outside, there's going to be little sphincters in these uh, distal capillaries here, and they're going to kind of um, block off access to the blood to the uh, surface of the body. And they're going to open up this little shunt that exists between this arterial and this uh, venule. And this is going to keep the blood from getting too close to the surface of the body. So we're going to conserve heat when it's cold outside. And when it's hot, we're going to allow that blood closer to the surface so that we can dissipate some of the heat. And this is going to work well because, one, this means we don't need to sweat to give off, uh, to cool down a little bit. And when you're not sweating, we're not losing uh, important water to keep us hydrated. Uh, so this is going to work well so long as the outside environment um, isn't too hot. Skin's also important for sensation, so we're going to have a whole host of different nerve endings embedded within our dermis and epidermis that are going to allow us to uh, sense different types of touch. So that can either be fine or blunt touch, uh, different levels of pressure, whether that be deep or uh, very superficial and light, 
Uh, we can sense temperature really well, as well as movement with on the body. So you can feel a little uh, ant crawling on your arm and as well as vibration. So we're going to go over the different types of uh, touch receptors at the end of this lecture and uh, all their uh, properties that uh, exist. The skin's also used uh, in a minor role with excretion, so uh, getting uh, different chemicals or molecules out of the body. This is going to be done mostly through sweat. So when we talk about sweat, it's uh, almost all water, but there will be some trace um, minerals, lactic acid, urea. So the way that uh, sweat works here, we're going to have a sweat gland down here, and there's going to be these capillaries that pass through it. And we didn't go over the cardiovascular system yet, but the way... Uh, blood works is it's going to be a bunch of blood cells um, floating within a plasma solution. And plasma is basically going to be water with dissolved solutes in it. And as this plasma with blood passes through the sweat gland, the plasma can diffuse out of it and enter into the sweat gland. And then it's going to go up to the outside of the skin. And then we're going to have our sweat released to the uh, cutaneous surface where it's going to be evaporated. And that evaporation is going to be what cools off the body. So looking at the different layers of the skin then, we're gonna start at the most superficial and start working our way down. And that's gonna begin with the epidermis. If you remember, epi means upon, dermis is gonna mean skin. So this is the outer layer of the skin and it's gonna be made of mostly epithelial tissues. So here in this picture, our epidermis is gonna be this dark pink area and everything above it. Uh, it's gonna be avascular, if you remember epithelial tissue is going to be very thin and only so many cell layers thick, so there's not going to be a lot of room for capillaries or, or um, blood to pass through. So it's going to get its nutrients through that underlying dermis, and if you remember, it's going to attach itself to that basement membrane. So here we can follow the basement membrane all the way around the uh, basal part of the epidermis. And so there's going to be five uh, distinct layers to the epidermis. So on our thick skins, like on our hands and soles of the feet, we have five layers. Whereas on the rest of the body, there's only going to be four layers of the epidermis. So we're going to look at each of these different layers now. Uh, starting at the base, then, uh, we have the um, uh, basal layer. Again, this is our basement membrane. And then as the cells grow on this uh, basal layer, they're going to divide and be pushed outward towards the surface of the body. And each of the layers that it passes through are going to be called a stratum. So we're going to start at the, last, at the first one called the stratum basal, or also known as the stratum germitinivum. Um, the book likes to call it basal, but you might see both of these. So again, the, you could say the skin germinates here on this first layer. And so the stratum basal is going to be the deepest layer of the epidermis. And it's going to be a single layer thick of uh, stem cells. And we don't really go over stem cells much, but these are cells that are going to continuously divide. So throughout your life, these stem cells are going to produce the rest of the skin cells that uh, are necessary above it. So that's going to include a lot of keratinocytes, which we'll look at, and some melanocytes and uh, some uh, immune cells. So as these stem cells divide, uh, you're going to have one stem cell divides into what we call two daughter cells. And then these daughter cells are going to migrate upward into the second layer called the stratum spinosum. Again, the stratum spinosum is that second layer. Here we can see it's going to be uh, much thicker, about eight to ten layers thick. So it's going to encompass this whole area here. And it's at this point that the cells are going to begin to develop a keratin protein. Uh, keratin protein is going to be what gives uh, the skin its uh, strong, durable properties. And the reason they call this the stratum spinosum is as we begin to develop that keratin, we're going to be able to more easily see uh, the cells on the uh, microscope slides and the uh, spininess is going to be ways for this uh, skin cells to kind of hook into each other to keep like a nice, compact, dense uh, border. So looking at keratin then, keratin is going to be a tough fibrous protein that these cells uh, develop. Again, they're going to be made by keratinocytes. So of all the cells within uh, the skin or the epidermis, keratinocytes are going to make up 90% of it. So the vast majority. And as long as, along with the skin, it's also going to be what uh, makes up both the hair and the nails. So charis in Greek is going to mean horn. 
And so animals with antlers or horns are also going to be uh, made of uh, keratin. And there's actually certain um, conditions where humans can develop horns as well. So here is a picture of uh, Mary Davis, the horned woman. And uh, it's not uncommon if you Google cutaneous horns, you'll see uh, people that develop horns usually on their hand, uh, hands or head or ears. Uh, they think it has something to do with uh, exposure to uh, radiation from sunlight, but we're not exactly sure. So you can, uh, humans can have horns. And keratin is also going to secrete fatty substances that help create that waterproof barrier. Again, it's going to repel those foreign substances as well as retain those fluids. Uh, the third layer up then is going to be the stratum granulosum, about three to five cell layers thick. Here we can see it's much more grainy looking compared to the other layers of the epidermis. And again, that graininess is going to be because we develop even more keratin now. So at this point, the cells are going to begin to lose all their other organelles. So the nucleus is going to go away. Other organelles are going to go away because the fate of these cells is to basically just die and sit on top of the skin to protect us. So we're not going to need all these organelles utilizing energy anymore. So we're just going to create more space for the keratin and uh, get rid of the organelles. And again, that granular appearance is because there's more fibrous proteins, uh, keratin in particular. Going up then is going to be that fourth layer that you only find in the hands and the feet. So this is going to be what gives uh, the soles and the palms their uh, thicker appearance. So it's called lucidum because it's going to be smooth and lucid. Lucid meaning uh, it's kind of somewhat transparent. And this has to do the, uh, with uh, the proteins that are rich in lipids, give it a clear appearance. So again, you only find this in uh, the thick skin on the hands and feet and the fingers. And then finally, we have that fifth layer, the outermost layer called the stratum corneum, sometimes called the horny layer. And here is where we have the real thickness of the epidermis, where it's 15 to 30 layers thick. And it's going to be uh, made of uh, flattened dead keratinized cells. So now all these cells that were once alive and dividing down here have basically lost all their organelles, uh, ceased all cellular activity, and now they're just dead and protective. Uh, this whole process takes uh, roughly around a month to complete. So from uh, first daughter cells to when we uh, sloth it off uh, constantly at the very uh, dis uh, end of the superficial end of the epidermis. And like I said, we're going to continuously shed these dead skin cells. And this is actually what the dust in your house is uh, mostly made of, is dead skin cells. So if you ever feel lonely in your quarantine, you can just uh, remember all the dust mites that are living with you that uh, you're generously feeding each day with your dead skin cells. Moving down from the epidermis then, uh, we have the what we call the true skin or just the dermis. Uh, what well, we call the true skin because this is basically where all the uh, really important functions happen. So we know that there's no blood vessels or not many nerves in the epidermis. So the dermis is going to be where you find all these other uh, accessory organs like uh, blood vessels, capillaries, sweat glands, hair follicles, uh, touch receptors. And the big difference is with the epidermis, because we have the stem cells, we're going to be continuously dividing, growing new cells constantly, whereas the dermis doesn't go through these uh, same changes. So the dermis does not grow and it does not divide. So when you get a cut down to the dermis, uh, it's not going to be as easy to heal. This is where scar tissue is going to come in because we can't re really replace it with new cells. We're just going to lay down that new uh, scar tissue and uh, heal that wound that way. You also notice that the epidermis and dermis don't exist uh, like in a flat line. There's going to be what we call these epidermal ridges. And anytime you see these convoluted ridge-like structures in the body, which are pretty much everywhere, it's a way to increase the amount of surface area. So more surface area, we can fit more cells and more receptors and more everything in that increased surface area. And this is going to be what gives us those classical fingerprint or handprint uh, swirls, whirls, and patterns. Uh, that we see. And again, these are going to be unique to each person, but this has to do with how the epidermis uh, sits on top of that dermis. Uh, kind of a side note, not really important or in the chapter, but we've all experienced when you soak your hands in water that your fingers and your hands, the skin actually wrinkles. So they originally thought that this was caused by osmosis of those keratinized cells. So basically you just soak these 
skin cells in water, and they're going to absorb uh, this water. Uh, osmosis, again, is the movement of water in and out of something. Uh, but it turns out this is no longer thought to be the main factor. And what it uh, actually comes down to is it's a sympathetic nervous system response. So your nervous system controls whether or not your finger wrinkles in water. Uh, the reason they were able to figure this out is if they cut the sympathetic nerves to the hands or the feet, uh, you're no longer going to wrinkle whatsoever. So the reason this is, is the sympathetic nervous system controls whether or not those blood vessels constrict or dilate. So what's going to happen is you have vasoconstriction of the hands and feet. And when you have constriction, you're going to create more space uh, for the epidermis to kind of sink into. So the uh, inward ridges of the wrinkled fingers are going to be because those constricted blood vessels in the area. And it turns out that uh, your grip is actually better when your fingers are wrinkled. So it seems to be kind of an evolutionary uh, uh, adaptation. So uh, the hypothesis that we kind of evolved around uh, watery or aquatic areas. And this just gave us the ability to uh, manipulate uh, different objects when it was wet out. So our grip is better because of this. And then finally, that last layer of the skin is going to be called the hypodermis. Again, hypo meaning below, uh, and dermis meaning skin. And it's also going to be called the subcutaneous layer. The skin is also known as the cutaneous membrane. So this is the area below the cutaneous membrane. And you're going to find the loose connective tissue. Uh, we also call it the areolar tissue in this hypodermis. You'll also find receptors and blood vessels here as well, similar to the dermis. But this is where we're going to store our adipose tissue. So adipose, like we said, is going to be a way to uh, retain, retain heat as well as um, storing energy and cushioning as well. So it's going to be good to have uh, this padding in this little area. I was actually watching a PBS Nova special about fat just the other day, and there was a disease where somebody basically couldn't store any fat. He was like 2% body fat, and just the act of walking and standing hurt his heel so much because he was lacking any cushion between his skin and bones. So fat is definitely beneficial um, in that sense. And as we can already tell, uh, men and women are going to store fat uh, differently. Women have more adipose in their breast tissue, hips, and inner thighs, whereas men are going to store their fat in their neck, arms, and abdomen. So then moving on to the skin pigmentation, the main uh, pigment associated with uh, skin color is going to be what we call melanin. So melanin is going to be what contributes to skin color, whether it's light or dark. And it's produced by special cells in the epidermis called melanocytes. Again, site meaning cell. So the darker the skin, uh, the better it's going to protect against UV radiation. So, um, and this is why when we're in the sun a lot, it's going to stimulate uh, the melanin and produce the tanning effect. So here we can see uh, this person's generally a lighter skin color, but because of the sun um, exposure, the melanocytes are going to be stimulated and they're going to release more melanin to help protect it. And then it's going to be genetics that determine the amount of melanin that the body produces. So we can see, uh, since it's going to be a protective against sunlight, uh, we can pretty much judge, depending on uh, the ethnicity of the person, w uh, where they uh, came from, because depending if they're closer to the equator, uh, there's more sunlight. So people closer to the equator or ethnicities closer to the equator are going to have darker skin because near the equator, there's uh, 12 hours of sunlight. So they're going to need extra protection from that UV radiation. As you move further away from the equator, you get less days of sunlight. And that's what we're looking at this map here. Uh, down here in the orange, uh, we have uh, 25 uh, hours per 2,500 hours per year of sunlight. Whereas up in the Scandinavian countries, countries, we have even half that. So as you move more north, you don't want to be uh, darker skinned anymore because you need to be able to absorb vitamin D more easily. Uh, so the lighter the skin, the more UV rays you can absorb and the more vitamin D you can get. Uh, this is also the reason, not just because there's less sunlight, but as you move higher up north as well, um, you're going to have to wear more uh, covering clothing uh, to keep yourself warm. So the more you wear, the less sun you absorb as well. 
So again, areas less in sunlight, you're going to have lighter skin, and that's to help uh, with vitamin D absorption. So again, another evolutionary adaptation, depending on uh, where in the world uh, you're from. So then moving on, we're gonna talk about all the different uh, basically types of skin color. Uh, we just need to know the definitions and the basically the color or the uh, characteristics that we're talking about. So this is just an overall uh, summary of everything, but we're gonna look at each individually. So we can have uh, areas of concentrated melanin. So this is gonna be a classic moles, uh, freckles here, or age spots or liver spots. And all this is is just an area of the skin where there's excess melanin. Um, nothing good or bad or harmful about it. Uh, when we talk about skin cancer, uh, particularly uh, melanoma, we're going to look at ways in which uh, pathological uh, moles, uh, there's going to be certain characteristics that we need to look for. And as massage therapists, that's going to be important because we're going to have access to uh, people's bodies where we might be able to recognize and uh, bring that to someone's attention. Albinism then is going to be a genetic condition where the body doesn't produce any melanin whatsoever. So you see this in about one in 70,000 uh, humans. And again, uh, there's just no melanin whatsoever. So very light skin. Uh, their hair will be uh, bleach white as well. And uh, also their eyes uh, aren't going to uh, have any uh, color whatsoever. Generally, uh, they're either going to be blue eyes or a lot of times you'll see uh, a reddish tint to them. And the reason that you're going to see red is because it's the blood in the back of the pupils that's actually showing through. And it's not just humans that can have albinosum. Every animal uh, as well can have albinosum. So here is an albino alligator. Uh, there's some albino deer you can see kind of running around every once in a while in our uh, neighborhoods. Vitiligo then is going to be when you have a partial or total loss of skin pigmentation. So here we have somebody with darker skin and because they have vitiligo, they're going to start to lose uh, this pigmentation and their skin is going to become lighter. So Michael Jackson is going to probably be one of the most famous examples of somebody with vitiligo, how he went from dark skin to eventually uh, completely light skin uh, with some medical uh, probably help there as well. Melasma is going to be um, when that you have uh, grayish or brown patches. And the reason I just bring this up with a uh, pregnancy massage uh, or pregnancy in general, you're going to see what we call linea nigra. So linea is a line, nigra is uh, black or dark. And this is when the hormones uh, due to pregnancy are going to cause this uh, dark line to show up on the uh, medial aspect of the anterior abdomen. You can also get something called a pregnancy mask where your cheeks get uh, darker colors as well. Uh, you can have an orange tint to the skin uh, due to carotene uh, uh, in your diet or in genetics. So it's a yellow golden color. Uh, you can see this mostly in Asian populations, but like I said, you can also get it from ex excessive carotene in the diet. And when we say excessive, a uh, very, very large amount. So you really have to try hard to uh, get carotenemia Again, emia being blood. So here in this picture, the, the nose you can see is going to be uh, more orange than it should be. Red colored skin is just going to be in hyperemic response. So excess blood flow to the surface of the skin. So we see this uh, when you blush, whether it's from overheating and you're trying to dissipate heat or through emotional reasons. And uh, the hyperemic response is very common uh, with massage. When you're working in an area, you're going to stimulate blood flow to those superficial uh, parts of the skin as well. So it's normal to see the skin redden um, after you've uh, worked the area, even just for a little bit. And some people are going to have a much more uh, uh, responsive hyperemic response than uh, others. The opposite of that then is going to be cyanosis. And this is going to be caused by a lack of oxygen uh, associated also with a lack of blood flow. So here we're going to look at a condition called uh, Raynaud syndrome, where you have vasoconstriction within the fingertips and the toes. And eventually you're going to end up with uh, blue-purple fingertips because, due to the lack of oxygen. Uh, but before you get to that point, oh, again, this is going to be, again, cyanosis, cyan for blue. So cyanosis is going to be associated with blue or purple color. And then before you get to that stage, you'll have paler or paleness. And this is also going to be a sign of anemia. So lack of blood or lack of red blood cells in the area. And you're not going to uh, 
have any kind of that flushing color. And you can see this when you take your finger and you squeeze it, you'll see it uh, turn white. And then as the blood comes back to it, it'll fill back up with a nice red uh, color. So same idea, just in certain people, especially anemic people, uh, they'll have more of a paler uh, shade to them. And then lastly, we have jaundice. Jaundice is gonna be a yellowing of the skin. Uh, and when we talk about the digestive system and liver disorders, this is gonna be caused by uh, excess bilirubin. Uh, it's gonna be easiest to see if somebody's jaundice in the whites of their eyes first. So if their eyes start to look yellow, uh, they're at the beginning stages of jaundice. You also see this in newborns. Uh, after a baby's born, they're not gonna be able to process the bilirubin. Uh, their system hasn't really come online yet to do this. And then to help uh, these newborns that are jaundiced, they're gonna actually put them in an artificial sunlight uh, area because uh, the, the UV rays are actually gonna shine through the skin and start breaking down that bilirubin. So that's a, a helpful kind of um, medical treatment for newborns with jaundice. Uh, we're going to briefly then look at hair and nails. Uh, hair is just going to be keratinized filaments uh, that arise from those pouch-like follicles uh, within that dermis. And it's going to cover the majority of the body. Uh, the only places you won't find hair are going to be in the soles of the hands, feet, uh, the lips, the nipples, and then the different, and some parts of the genitalia. Everyone else, everywhere else you'll have some hair. So here, if you haven't already told, this is my beautiful hair from a couple of years ago. I realized I was going bald and I wanted to have one last hurrah, so I grew my hair out uh, for at least over a year. So that's what I got to treat my family to every time we went out. So you can see I'm a lover of hair. This is me and my sister. This is probably the best Afro picture I have. Uh, some other ones. This was right before I cut it. Uh, you can tell I was going bald in the middle. It's getting real bad at this point, so I had to kind of just give up the dream. So then this is me being sad about that. And then lastly, I always liked embarrassing my family or more particularly Michelle. And sometimes I would just cut my hair. Can't really tell. I got some sweet kind of mutton chops on the side here. So we actually went walking at Peace Valley like that. So that's how you can tell uh, your girlfriend really loves you when she still goes out with you uh, when you test her with different hairstyles. So as far as the functions of hair then, uh, it's gonna be used to protect uh, both the skin and the body orifices. So our eyebrows are gonna be able to keep uh, the sweat and dirt out of our eyes. Eyelashes are same thing, they're gonna protect our eyes from uh, any dust or uh, particles in the air. We have hair in both our nose and our ears, and again, that's to protect just these openings uh, to the internal surface, internal parts of the body. Uh, it also increases our sensitive touch, so whenever you have something kind of hit that shaft of the hair, it's going to stimulate those touch receptors as well. So this is, again, what allows you to feel those small little creepy crawly things on you sometimes, and you can knock them off before they bite you. Along with that, hair is also good for so social signaling, so uh, our different expressions with our eyebrows are going to be are going to allow us to communicate our emotions much more easily. If you've ever seen somebody uh, that either shaved their eyebrows or doesn't have eyebrows, uh, it is much harder to kind of read their facial expressions uh, as compared to not uh, compared to somebody with them. And same thing uh, is longer your hair, generally the healthier you're considered to be. This is why uh, long hair is kind of a uh, signature of beauty because people with long hair, it means that their body's healthy enough to maintain it. Uh, people with health conditions or chronic health conditions, a lot of times their hair will start to fall out or not be able to grow very long. So it's just a sign of uh, poor health sometimes if uh, your hair is falling out or not growing. Uh, we also have excessive hair in our axial and pubic regions, so our armpit and uh, pubic hair. Uh, the idea there is might be protective. And uh, we're going to learn that there's special uh, uh, sweat glands in these regions as well. So the hair might kind of be a way of holding on to that oily sweat uh, as a way of kind of uh, maintaining certain scents, perhaps. Uh, that's one of the guesses. And so this hair, this excess hair is going to be stimulated by testosterone. So this is going to be the reason why men 
are generally hairier with hairier chest and beards, and that's going to be due to the effects of the hormone testosterone. On each of the hairs that we look at then, there's going to be a small uh, smooth muscle called the erector pili that attaches to that hair follicle. And then when this smooth muscle contracts, it's going to pull the hair straight and uh, this is what's going to cause what is generally is going to be called goosebumps. So that can be either brought on by cold temperatures or uh, through emotional response as well. So when the hair on the back of your neck stands up, it's those erector play that are contracting and pulling that hair straight. So the reason cold temperatures brings it on is uh, back in the day when we had uh, much more hair like other primates like chimps, uh, puffing that hair up created a layer of insulating air that would help keep the animals warm or uh, animals with fur warm. Now we kind of lost all that body hair, but the little bit that we do have, you can still uh, see puff up. So here again, you can see our goosebumps and the hair stand up straight and uh, lots of animals, particularly cats and dogs, you'll see uh, them stand their hair up. So along with arching their back, that's just a way of kind of making them present as larger than they really are to try to scare off uh, whoever uh, is trying to bother them. So it's kind of a defensive uh, posturing. Looking at the skin glands then, there's going to be two major types of skin glands. Uh, there's, either, there's going to be oil glands and then sweat glands. So we're going to first look at the oil glands, which are called sebaceous glands. So sebaceous glands produce an oil that we're going to call sebum. So here we can see our sebaceous gland, and it's going to connect directly with the um, hair follicle here, and it's going to come up through that shaft with the uh, hair itself. So we're going to call a sebaceous gland an exocrine gland. If you remember when we talked about medical prefixes and suffixes, endocrine, endo meant uh, things we secrete inside, so crin means secrete. Uh, exo, in this case, we're secreting something out of the body. So uh, uh, something into a duct. So this is our duct here, and then it's going to go out of the body. And what the sebum is going to do is it prevents drying out uh, of the skin and the hair, and it also has some antibacterial properties as well. And then sebum production, as we all, I'm sure, experience, is going to increase uh, during puberty. So the hormones of puberty are going to stimulate excessive sebum, and that's why uh, you're much more prone to have an oily face, oily hair as teenagers. And again, this is going to lead then to uh, acne. So acne is going to be the formation of pimples, but what happens is it's caused by a blocked sebaceous gland. So in a normal gland here, uh, the oil can escape uh, with no problem. When it becomes blocked, that oil is going to build up then and it's going to cause a small inflammatory reaction. So when it turns white like this or a white-headed pimple, uh, that white is going to be uh, the white blood cells trying to uh, prevent, uh, help fix the infection. So that's going to be pus. Whereas a blackhead is just going to be um, a clogged pore that isn't infected. So the oil begins to oxidize, which turns it black, and that just creates the signature blackhead. We'll look at that a little bit more with pathology. Moving on to sweat glands, then we have our apocrine sweat glands. Again, it's going to be a type of sudiferous gland, sudiferous meaning sweat. Uh, and these are going to be different in that they release or secrete an oily type of fluid. Um, it's going to be mostly located in the axillary and groin regions. Um, and they're going to begin to function at puberty. And it's not that the oil itself smells bad, but as this oil sits on your skin, you're gonna have a bunch of bacteria that naturally live on the skin. They're gonna break down this oily substance, and it's gonna be the byproducts of that uh, microbial metabolism that causes the body odor that we all recognize. Um, possibly, uh, these oily fluids may act as a pheromone. So a pheromone is gonna be a chemical signal that a lot of different animals use to kind of signify or uh, communicate with other animals. Uh, no one's really sure if humans are sensitive to pheromones or whether or not we even release them. Um, as far as the brain research, they're not really sure if the olfactory bulb or the part of the brain that typically senses uh, pheromones in other animals. Uh, it's, it's much smaller in humans and uh, whether I don't even know if this really existed. I had a teacher that studied pheromones and he didn't seem too confident in them. But I know people go back and forth on that. So uh, the apocrines may be associated with pheromone communication. 
There's other types of specialized apocrine glands. The ones I want you to know are going to be the ceruminous glands. Uh, these are going to be the glands within the ear canal that produce earwax. So the technical name for earwax is cerumen. And here you can see the small glands here in the ear canal. And that's where the earwax is going to come from. And again, earwax is going to be a protective mechanism to keep uh, things from crawling into your ears. Um, my wife's uncle worked in the ER for a long time. He said at least once a week, uh, he'd have somebody come in with a bug that crawled in their ear while they were sleeping. So it's always good to have a little bit of wax in your ear. And again, you don't want to use those Q-tips. I know it's, it has that warrant on every piece of Q-tip, uh, not to stick anything in your ears. And everyone does. But ideally, uh, you shouldn't, uh, particularly because you can help, you can kind of compact it down in there more and make things worse. So you should just wash around the outside of the ear with water, and that should be enough. You'll also find apocrine glands in areas like the areola or nipples of the breast, uh, the parts of the eyelids, and some nostrils. Don't worry about that one, but they do exist in other places. And then the sweat glands that we usually associate with sweat are going to be called the eccrine sweat glands. And these are going to be what secrete sweat directly onto the surface of the skin. And it's this sweat that's going to evaporate and help cool the body off. So the eccrine sweat glands are going to be used for uh, thermoregulation. Briefly, I'll just kind of introduce nails. Um, Mblex, I don't think has ever asked anything about nails, uh, so I'll just kind of introduce the different terms for it, but I'm not going to ask anything on the test. But nails are going to be compact, again, keratinized epidermal cells that protect the tips of the fingers and toes, kind of help give it uh, our shape as well. So whenever you see the nail root, anytime you see root in anatomy, it's going to be the area uh, where things kind of grow out of. So this is going to be the site of growth of the nail. Uh, the nail bed is going to be the whole uh, middle part, the pink area. Uh, the cuticle is part of the stratum corneum, so the outside the epidermis that overlaps the bottom part of the nail. And then the luna, anytime you see luna, it's going to be something moon-shaped. So in this case, it's the crescent-shaped white area at the base of the nail. And then finally, we're going to talk about those skin receptors. So because skin receptors are part of the nervous system, their job is to sense uh, the different parts of the environment that are touching uh, or making contact with our body. So when we talk about touch, it's the ability to perceive things through physical contact. And obviously, as massage therapists, this is going to be uh, vital to how we work with our clients, understanding touch. So what happens is each of these different receptors, uh, like I said, some detect vibration, pressure, temperature, all of them are going to send information to a specific part of the brain called the somatosensory cortex. So soma is going to mean body, sensory is uh, what we sense, and cortex is just certain areas of the brain that we're talking about. And what the somatosensory cortex is interesting about it is it's going to represent the whole body on the part of the cortical tissue within that brain. So what we mean by that is this part of the brain, if we were to stimulate with an electrode, and people have done this experiment when they were getting seizure uh, surgeries uh, many decades ago, they would put an electrode on this particular cell on the somatosensory cortex, and since the person's awake during brain surgery, because they need to be able to communicate with the doctor if they're doing something uh, wrong, the, they can say, oh, I sense someone touching my tongue, or if we were to touch here on the hand, uh, with an electrode, they would feel something on their hand. So they were able to map out the entire somatosensory cortex uh, with these electrodes, and this is what they come with. And you'll notice that the hand and thumb are much bigger than, say, the leg here, and that's because the areas of the body that are very sensitive are going to have more brain real estate um, to kind of allow for that increased amount of sensitivity. So things like the tongue, um, the tongue, nose, lips, hands are going to be much more sensitive. And the, uh, we can kind of draw this out in what uh, scientists are going to call the homunculus. The homunculus is going to be a visual representation of that somatosensory cortex. So if we were to look like how our skin receptors uh, sense the world, our hands would be gigantic because of how much sensory information comes through them. Same thing with our lips ears, genitals, uh, these are going to be the much more sensitive areas. So we call this the homunculus. And then we're going to talk about a couple of the particular uh, touch receptors. 
So in this case, the Meisner core puzzle is going to be what detects light pressure. So when you're doing those nerve strokes that not a lot of people seem to like, those are going to be what are stimulate the Meisner core puzzles. So that's going to be good for fine discriminating touch. So when a blind person is learning to read Braille, they're going to be stimulating those Meisner core puzzles, and that's what's going to allow them to be able to uh, pick up those discriminating little bumps on the paper. So you're going to find these most numerous in the hairless skin. So again, hairless is going to be on the soles of the hands and the feet. A uh, Merkel disc is going to be similar to a Meisner corpuscle. Uh, it's also going to sense pressure, uh, but it's just less sensitive and slower adapting. So with a Meisner corpuscle, you're going to feel things uh, much more quickly. But with a Merkel disc, uh, you're going to be able to sense things for a longer amount of time. So I've been holding this pen this whole time, and I can still feel it in my hand. And that's going to be part of the job of the Merkel disc to uh, let me know that I'm still holding something or still touching something. Uh, Pisidian corpuscle, what I want you to know about that is this is going to be the receptor that's responsible for deep pressure. So when we're doing deep tissue massage, we're going to be uh, particularly stating these Pisidian corpuscles. Uh, they're also going to respond to high frequency vibration, but on the test, I'll have a matching section and I want you to know Pisidian is deep pressure. And someone kind of gave a helpful hint for remembering Pisidian's like Pacific and Pacific's the deepest ocean, so Pisidian corpuscle is uh, registering deep pressure. A Ruffini corpuscle is going to be a dermal stretch receptor. Uh, the book doesn't really get into this. I don't know a lot about the Ruffini, so I'm not going to ask a lot of questions. But the idea is if you see Ruffini corpuscle uh, on the MBLEX, just think, oh, we're talking touch receptors. And that amount of information should be enough to get you to get the correct answer. So just know Ruffini corpuscle is also a touch receptor found in the skin. And some other ones, a thermo receptors. We'll talk about the nervous system section. But thermo means that they're going to sense temperature. And a Krauss corpuscle is particularly going to be uh, able to sense cold temperature. So when you see Krauss corpuscle, it's sensing cold temperature. So that's it for this chapter. Uh, luckily, nothing like the sliding filament theory. Uh, no no uh, really complicated pathology. So a lot of definitional stuff. And again, on Monday, we'll go over the different pathologies. Again, pathology is going to be super important for massage therapists because we don't want to touch something on somebody's skin. We want to be able to recognize uh, if something's dangerous before um, we touch it. So we're going to spend a lot of time looking at all the different contagious pathologies. So I'll try to keep the gross pictures to a minimum. Uh, again, use the discussion board on Blackboard if you have any questions. 